Trey and I are on the Sanctuary Advisory Council no. together. We were just no. over at a meeting. Oh. We were just at a, a five day meeting, four and a half day meeting on the walking uh, with uh, the West Path and the Sanctuary Advisory Council, sort of co, co uh, sponsored. And uh, Jack gave a fabulous talk, and we've sent around information to all of you about Jack, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail here. I've known each other for a few months now, working on the Sanctuary Advisory Council, and, um, and Jay and I met at this recent Coastal Marine Special Planning uh, training session. And there's some familiar faces among the people that I've talked to. <coughs> so, um, uh, I'm a, a social scientist. Uh, which uh, means I study people instead of fish in a nutshell. And uh, when I went back to do my PhD, uh, uh, which I did at UH, uh, I primarily focused on historical ecology, but now I work primarily in two areas, and that includes historical ecology, uh, which is the history of marine ecosystems and how people have interacted with it through time. Uh, but the other area that I work in is in marine governance, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Is uh, how do we govern marine resources? What are uh, different examples of, of how that works, and what can we learn from other places around the world that might be applicable here in Hawaii or elsewhere? Um, so, um, so over the past year, I've been working primarily as a consultant and uh, basically a researcher for hire. Um, and what I'm going to talk today, I'm going to focus a lot about on co-management. And co-management uh, is a is a kind of buzzword in marine governance, uh, and it's got variable uh, forms. Uh, uh, around depending on where you look, but in a nutshell, what it means is the uh, uh, the adoption of, of, of a community-based approach to marine resource management, whereby the state, whether it's the state of Hawaii or the uh, or a region of Chile, gives the community some authority and local power to manage those resources. So it's a relationship between the state and uh, the communities to manage resources. Uh, and like I said, that can take a variety of forms. So um, in the Pacific, we know that uh, uh, community-based management has a long history. Uh, Pacific Islanders evolved with a close connection to uh, reef resources <coughs> and, and, and developed uh, very complex traditional management institutions to manage uh, uh, your shore marine resources. And, and Hawaii, of course, has become uh, the poster child for uh, ecosystem-based management because the traditional institutions of ahupua'a-based management uh, are, are known uh, throughout the resource community as being kind of the gold standard for what we want to get back to. Um, and, and as far as the Pacific goes, uh, the Center for Ocean Solutions, who, is, uh, who I'll be working for uh, starting next month, uh, convened a, a, a workshop with uh, Pacific Island leaders in Honolulu a couple years ago. And, uh, and those folks got together and identified the four major threats to uh, the Pacific Ocean, and those include these four threats. And those are the broad, overarching threats, but of course there are place-specific threats as well. For example, invasive species pose a significant threat to some coral reefs here in Hawaii. Um, now we know that those threats are, are cumulative and that they, overact, uh, that they they overlap and interact with each other, and that multiple threats can impart multiple harm to uh, ocean environment. So this is a map that was published in the magazine Science back in 2008. And what these people did was just take all the threats of human activities, overlay them spatially in a map, and identified areas that are in really bad shape and areas that are in uh, okay shape. And, uh, and what this map shows in a nutshell is that there is no, really not many places left that are free from major human impact. Um, and the reason this is, of course, is concerned because we rely on the oceans for, uh, for many things. And, and what these things are often uh, termed in the academic community, and it's a term that's increasingly being brought into the public realm, are ecosystem services. And those are just the benefits and things that we get from the ocean, whether it's breathable air, or fish to eat, uh, or so on. Uh, and most of the time when, when these things are discussed in the policy sphere, at least at the higher levels, uh, there's often times uh, uh, big dollar amounts that are assigned to these things, like the global worth of fish are, are so many millions of dollars. But the thing that I was struck by being a part of that workshop with Pacific Islander leaders, and, this, and that carried through uh, in a recent uh, 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 event that was held in Honolulu called the Cabo Bowl Ocean Summit, which was similar in that it brought together Pacific Island leaders, is that when Pacific Islanders talk about these ecosystem services and benefits, uh, 
the, the dollar amounts don't matter because what matters to them is the perpetuation of cultural values, traditions, and practices. And you simply can't put a monetary value on that. So uh, threatens, uh, the, the threats of human activities to those types of things uh, are much more insidious and, and, and difficult to quantify. And the problem uh, with the human threats is that we haven't really gotten past this issue of fragmented ocean governance. This is a map from the Southern California coast. Again, this was published in Science a few years back. Um, and it just shows, you don't need to know what all those different things are, but it just shows the, the different management authorities and agencies and institutions uh, involved in coastal and marine management in Southern California. And it's immense. I mean, look at that. That looks like a mess, right? And, and we haven't figured out how to basically get out of this fragmented governance system into a more integrated governance system. And part of the problem is we don't know how to initiate the change going from this messy situation to a collaborative uh, uh, management situation. And that remains a central challenge uh, uh, for the United States and other places around the world. So uh, we know we need to transform our approach. Uh, what do we mean by transforming our approach uh, the, from business as usual to a new some, uh, integrated marine governance system that will work differently? Uh, well, we put a, a definition for what we mean by transformation. Uh, we published this uh, a couple years ago. And it just means the capacity to adjust the way you manage the environment uh, to, to new drivers and internal processes. And the key point here is that it, it, this uh, conveys an advantage in allowing an institution or an organization uh, to develop along a new trajectory or pathway. So that means shifting fundamentally the way that we do things to a new trajectory of, of, of um, actually the same sure. or different than adaptive management? Adaptive management uh, means that when you formulate a policy, that you use that as an uncontrolled experiment. Meaning that, okay, we've got this idea to control invasive species, for example. We're going to go out there and hand pull the algae out every two weeks for, over the next year. And at the end of that year, you evaluate whether or not that worked. And if it worked, great, we're going to stay with it. If it didn't work, what did not work about it? How do we adjust it? That's an adaptive kind of iterative process that keeps going forward. What I mean by transformation is, is, is developing the capacity to completely change the way that uh, we manage the marine environment. And an adaptive process would be you know, a change that we can do. So, uh, and one of the things that we're interested in in terms of, of what uh, allows us to transform the way we do uh, management is what provides the mechanism for change. And Robin and I were actually talking about this in the car ride from the airport on the way over. Uh, there's multiple ways that things can be initiated. For example, we can have a new policy. For example, the United States is getting ready to engage in deploying this coastal and marine spatial planning throughout the entire US. Um, that's a new policy that's going to come down and has the potential to open a window of opportunity for us to change. Or it could be a new fisheries policy or whatever, right? Pollution prevention policy. Uh, but quite often the mechanism for change are, are crises, right? Because it's during the time of crisis that things are most open to dramatic transformation. And so we'll talk about that in a couple of case studies. And I just mis mentioned the coastal marine spatial planning because, you know, it's good if we don't have to rely on crises to change, right? That would be nice if we lived in that kind of world. Uh, but policy windows are also equally important, and those have also provided that window of opportunity in other places. And there's multiple policies, and this is a big scale thing um, deployed at the national level, uh, which you know we're told that they're, they're supposed to do it in a very community-based way. But if you look at this, they're going to do it in a regional way. Uh, these are the different regions, and of course, the Pacific Island region um, is very different from the other regions in that it's discontiguous. There are different archipelagos with different cultures, different levels of human habitation. We've got uninhabited atolls like Wake, and we've got highly inhabited islands like Oahu. So the way that this gets deployed is going to be uh, unique in the Pacific in that it'll basically be a series of sub-regions, I think, that'll have to engage in this kind of planning process. And so this might provide the impetus to change the way we manage the environment. Um, when I think of this problem of integrating marine governance, to me as a researcher, it boils down to two primary questions. And the first is how do we initiate uh, the change and sustain it and maintain it? Uh, and then the second question, which uh, is equally important, is uh, how do institutions and stakeholders engage and fruitfully engage? Because we're all familiar, I think, with the stalemate uh, process that happens in conservation, where stakeholders battle and there's lots of conflict. 
Uh, the other question, the flip side of that, of that, is how do multiple agencies and multiple stakeholders groups successfully engage? And that's something that we're studying in, in a lot of places around the world uh, in a research group that I'm part of. So I'm going to share some of those uh, case studies. And the key here is that we're just looking at places where things have changed and where folks have adopted a new approach. What initiated the change? What strategies did they use? What can we learn from these strategies? Uh, and then, as I said, I'm part of a research group. This is. Um, uh, a group of researchers that study marine governance, and uh, you know, it's basically a group of nerds uh, involved in marine governance research, right? So, uh, a lot of these folks are actually based in Stockholm at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and uh, everyone is familiar with this term resilience, right? This is the new buzzword in conservation and implementation of, of conservation planning. Uh, it grew out of uh, multiple things, but uh, anyway, that's the, the, this is based at Stockholm University. We organized a symposium on these topics uh, this spring in Arizona State where the resilience meeting was held, and I'm just going to present some of these case studies, and I want to stress at the beginning that this work draws on a lot of my colleagues and collaborators. This is not research that, that I've done, per se, but that, that they have done, that they've uh, uh, shared with me. So um, I have done work on this, but I'm not going to share my own work. Uh, I like their work better. So, anyway, um, the great, oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna, I'm going to focus first on the Great Barrier Reef Rezoning, second on uh, Chilean artisanal fisheries and the co management approach there, and then we're just kind of briefly touch on other co management models because I know that's of interest to folks in the room, and so I altered the topic and trained a little bit because it's interesting. Okay, the Great Barrier Reef Rezoning, uh, probably everyone's familiar with the Great Barrier Reef, right? This major marine park off the uh, northeast coast of the Australian uh, continent. And it was first established in the mid 70s, and the things that caused it to be established, does anybody know what drove the establishment of the Great Barrier Reef? Well, yeah, but what were the big threats? Why did we need to do it? What were the big, anybody? anybody? Crown, of thorns. Crown of Thorns was a major one. And the other one was mining and drilling off the coast of Australia that a lot of Australians were worried about. So those were the two things that galvanized the establishment of the Marine Park Authority uh, in the mid-70s. And at the time, it was the largest marine park, uh, you know, marine protected area in the world. Uh, and it was all the way up until the establishment of Papahana Mokuakea in 2006. Uh, there's four regions to it. This is the map of the northernmost region. You can see it's pretty complex, a lot of moving parts. Uh, but they were first zoned in the mid-80s. Uh, but a major rezoning was undertaken in 1998. And the point of that re rezoning was to uh, protect 20% of all the different habitat types in the park. And, uh, and they identified 70 different habitat types. So everything from sponge reefs to seagrass beds, coral reefs, and so on. And the point was to put in no-take reservation 20% of all each of those habitat types. And that resulted in a major change from 4.5% no-take to a third of the park no-take. Now that's a big change in the way this place was managed. How did they get it done? Well first, what provided the impetus for change? Two things. Uh, first of all, there's a major El Nino event in the uh, late 90s, which uh, you know, folks were in the Pacific at that time, you know that was a major issue. Bleaching occurred throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, here's a picture of reefs in Australia and what they look like, and in the words of one of the managers of the Marine Park Authority, this was like a major wake-up call, right? Uh, they had this marine protected area and then this El Nino event hit and it was like, whoa, we were totally unprepared for some of these big threats that are coming down the pipe. Uh, at the same time, they were doing these big seascape experiments on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and these were somewhat uh, prescient in that the scientists who had designed these experiments were interested in increasing reef resilience to climate change. And what they did was they built these big fenced enclosures on the reef and they were interested in whether or not no-take uh, areas, basically excluding fishing, would uh, enhance resilience to coral uh, bleaching and climate change threats. And what they showed was that actually the protection of herbivorous fish was crucially important, right? And that makes all the sense in the world. Herbivorous fish uh, keep the algae populations in check, which and then uh, in part reef building corals uh, with more, uh, to have more resilience to climate change. And so these, these findings happened about the same time that the bleaching event occurred uh, serendipitously and as a result, the Marine Park Authority launched this representative areas program, which uh, was the big reason why. Uh, how do they get it done? How do they navigate this major change in the way they manage this area? Well, the first thing is that the uh, you know this is a big government agency, the Marine Park Authority. And, 
and, uh, and, and so they knew that they had to change the way they were organized in order to get this done. Uh, at the highest levels, they actually changed the way that the senior managers engaged with each other. They formed this forum uh, where they could debate and discuss this, uh, this rezoning, and they assigned regional teams. There's four regions, as I mentioned, so each team had a part of the part that they had to engage with the public on in order to be, build a rezoning plan. Uh, a lot of this uh, uh, effort was informed by a two-way dialogue between scientists and the managers. The scientists were doing research in the park and were pushing those results into the management sphere. At the same time, the folks on the management side of the fence were saying, look, we need information in these critical areas. So it was really a two-way road of them working together. The, the authority formed these expert panels and committees. They had expert workshops on key issues, and they really established a good relationship with the scientific community. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is a point of national pride to Australians. You know, they're really proud of this in the audience. Um, but at the time, it was viewed as a pristine ecosystem that didn't really need any more protection, right? That was the perception. We got it done in the mid-70s. It's there. We're good. And they had to go out to the public and say, look, we're not good. We're threatened with climate change and these things that are beyond the borders of, uh, of the actual park itself. And we've got to change the way that we manage this place or we're going to lose this incredible resource. And so they developed this Reef Under Pressure information campaign that really went to the public and, and, and made them aware of all these issues that were that were in the uh, They engaged the public. You know, every reef has a constituency. Every marine environment has a constituency. And the uh, Great Barrier Reef is, is very similar to other places in the world that are, you know, where people, there's an active ocean user community. And, uh, and they held several hundred community information sessions. I just think that's amazing. Several hundred sessions. And they did this over a period of six years to engage the public, to let them know the threats, but also to ask them what they thought the rezoning should look like, which areas were the most highly valued fishery grounds, where could they cite these uh, zoning notate areas that would, uh, would have the least amount of socioeconomic impact on ocean users and so on. And as a result, in talking with some of the folks who actually did this, they said they went through this incredible process over six years, and it really started off in meetings where the public was completely hostile to the management folks. And it took them years of relationship building where it became the opposite, where the local folks be became the owners of the process and, and, and took ownership of, of, of the entire thing and, and became advocates for it and helped establish these places. So. Uh, and that wasn't, you know, a conflict-free process, right? But it was difficult, rocky, but uh, they got it done. And lastly, the folks uh, in the management uh, agency were very politically savvy. They knew uh, from the outset that they had to get some of these higher-level political leaders on board, and they and they went to those folks. They sold them on it. They got them on board, and they knew they had to time things correctly. So they looked at the legislative calendar. They looked at the kind of political situation and the context, and they timed it correctly. Uh, we're savvy about that, and that was key. So what we learned from the Great Barrier Reef, uh, first of all, the innovation and flexibility on behalf of the actual management agency. This is, uh, you know, this is a big kind of NOAA-like agency in terms of their, their mandate and their scope, uh, but at the same time, this could apply to institutions and organizations at any level, right? Being flexible and willing to adapt the way you're organized in order to get things done. Uh, leadership, really key, the, uh, the Marine Park Authority uh, allocated resources to this. They made it their priority objective. They also got leadership at the highest political letter, uh, levels, which enabled uh, uh, this whole process to move forward. And they found and, and navigated this window of political opportunity, and that was really key. Uh, they got uh, the public on board, and they got the political leaders on board, and they knew they had a short window in order to get this done, and they successfully navigated it. Uh, and the thing that's interesting to me about this is that actually the rezoning started off as this tiny little project in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And then, and then once that bleaching occurred, it, it just got, you know, the impetus. It became this major, the major project that they engaged with over six years. And now this is viewed as like the gold standard for how you rezone a complex uh, marine <coughs> space. And, and folks are using the tools they develop, the methods they develop. And that, these ideas have basically been disseminated throughout the world. So that's the Great Barrier Reef Rezone. Now let's talk about Chilean artisanal fisheries. Uh, Chile, uh, I don't know how familiar people are with the political history of Chile, but the, there's this dictator, Pinochet, who was deposed in the late 80s, right? It's basically 
his uh, regime was kicked out and a new democratic government was organized in the early 90s. Um, and there was this new legislation that was passed in 1991, the Fishery and Aquaculture Law, which did a number of things. It established marine protected areas along the coast of Chile, um, but it also used this zoning system to regulate artisanal fishing fleets versus industrial fishing fleets. And the industrial fleets in this area are these big, giant ships that go out and harvest primarily anchovies and sardines off the coast. This is a big fishery off the, you know, that area of the world. And, um, but for the artisanal fleets, what it did, there are two major zoning things. First of all, this gray shaded area is just uh, the, the uh, that's zero to five nautical miles. And that was reserved for artisanal uh, uh, fin fish fisheries off the coast. So they basically kicked these big industrial fleets to the offshore zones and reserved that near shore space for these artisanal fisheries. But the part that I'm going to talk primarily about are these benthic zones. And that was the other major zoning. These are marine benthic resource management zones uh, that were managed by unions of artisanal fishers. And, and what they called those were territorial user rights for fisheries, or TERFs. And in these things, uh, there are transferable quotas for the actual fishers themselves. And this is really kind of interesting. Yeah. Let me just ask in this context, what, do you, what does that mean, you mean by artisanal? You mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, artisanal. Uh, doesn't there's not any just like co-management there's not any straightforward definition uh, but it typically means small scale and somewhat there's a traditional or indigenous aspect to it or both um, but it's not necessarily only subsistence or non-commercial in fact these are commercial fisheries so it doesn't there's there's not a you know a strictly subsistence aspect to it. it means not yeah small scale but not like um, large business. Typically, that's typically it. But I mean, it depends on where you're at. So they using traditional methods or practices. Sometimes, you know, these fisheries are probably these. These are more are, are in Chile. It's more small scale. Uh, they they're divers. Uh, they're fin fishers. They're using, you know, somewhat traditional boats. But what's a traditional boat? You know, it depends on you know boats evolve and change right throughout time. So no one wants to see it. <laughs> In fact, let's look at them. Here they are. Um, <laughs> so there's two types of artisanal fishing, at least in Chilean terms. There's the small-scale guys that use these little boats to access the nearshore areas. There's a, a real inshore areas. Uh, and then there's these mid-scale boats that kind of look like this. I don't know if I'd call that a traditional boat, but it's uh, it's you know it's an artisanal fishing boat in Chile, and it differs completely from these massive. And if, you, if anybody's ever been down there and seen those big sardine boats, these industrial ones, they're really big. They're huge. So, so anyway, this is, this is what I'm going to focus on. This is a small-scale uh, artisanal fleet that primarily focuses on benthic invertebrates. The shellfish fisheries down there are the big inshore fisheries that these guys focus on. Um, and what, so what happened? What caused the change in this area? Uh, in the 1980s, this fishery was open access, meaning there was no um, uh, spatial restrictions on fishers. And what happened was you got these roving bandits, or just people that, you know, they they go and fish one area, they deplete it, move on to the next area, right? So it's just serial depletion of, of fishery resources. And what happened was is these uh, these benthic invertebrates that are a major grazer of algae in this system uh, were completely wiped out in most systems, and you got algae overgrowth. That's what this is right here, algal overgrowth. At the same time, prices crashed, because what you have is a bunch of individual fishers going out and racing towards the fish, right? Race towards the, the, the shellfish and just serial depletion as a result. But it's also socioeconomically detrimental because uh, since there's so many people bringing product to the market, the, the price is low. So if the price is low and you're a fisherman, what do you have to do? You gotta catch more, right? So it's kind of a negative feedback. And so what you have here, these different arrows are just the individual catches of different fishermen. When they were established these turf systems, these communally managed places where uh, fisheries uh, uh, unions were formed, uh, what happened was that greatly decreased uh, uh, exploitation pressure in a number of ways, but it allowed the ecosystem to recover. So that's the same place in 2009, almost 20 years later. And you have a communal harvest here where the, the catch is sold through a collective. The prices are higher. They can uh, control the, the supply in the markets, and they're making more money. So it's a much more positive system. Uh, how do they get this done? Well, these, these benthic resource areas, basically the policy granted fishermen the rights to organize in collectives and to manage those areas themselves. 
uh, it created a sense of ownership among these folks, right? Because they have the ability to exclude outsiders. No more roving bandits. These areas, this area, that's just for our unit. You cannot come in unless you're part of the union. Now, if you want to move to a different area or something, you can transfer your quota, right? You can sell your quota to someone else, transfer it to someone else, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is the, one of the major things. This is a Bentley Dash or called, called a local. And, uh, and this has been work that Stefan Gelsich has done down there. And so the other key thing is that you know, they can exclude outsiders, but they are also the main monitors of the resource and the main folks engaged in crafting a site-specific management plan. So if they monitor the resource, they have a higher degree of knowledge of the condition of the resource. The monitoring they do directly informs the total allowable catch for their area. So they're, they're the stewards for this resource. Does the union decide what the total, the, the total allowable catch is? No. Or is that somebody else? They, they decide. <coughs> but it has to fit within the framework of the law, so it can't be something crazy. The way I understand. The interesting thing about this is it totally works. Here's the, uh, the density of these gastropods under an open access area, completely depleted. These turfs are no different statistically from no-take marine protected areas that are adjacent to them. That's incredible. This is a really powerful slide to me for co-management, right? This demonstrates successful management. Look at the catch inside the turfs, uh, 10 times what it is in open access areas. So the folks are, are, the catch per unit effort has gone down, they're fishing less, they're making more, and the ecosystem has recovered. This is a win-win situation, right? So how did they get this done? One of the things they did was they started these uh, pilot projects. They didn't just roll this policy out at the national level. They did this in two or three areas and they showed that it worked. And by they, I mean the, the entire stakeholder community. The fishermen, the scientists, and the managers really worked together on this. And that, I think, is a key lesson learned, right? Because these folks come from different backgrounds, different uh, idea sets, different priorities, different worldviews in some cases. But they got together and they, and they, they showed that this proof of concept could work. And you know what? When, it, when all those stakeholders advocate for the same solution, that becomes a very politically palatable solution, right? And that's what happened at the, at the national level. The legislation was adopted because those uh, advocacy communities were really strong and they brought everyone to the table. Uh, but the key thing, I think, is participation of the stakeholders as well as granting ownership to those fishing unions to actually do it themselves. And that creates the incentives, right? It puts the incentives on the place. Yes? Does this process affect me? Is it just Well, yeah, I mean, part of this, uh, part of this fishery, as I understand it, is some, a lot of the catch is subsistence use is all, as well, but it's also the livelihoods of the folks. They sell a majority of the cash to support their livelihood. Um, so, and, and you know, these, these are for, those areas are for benthic resources. So there's some fin fishing that goes on and other gathering that occurs as well. So, but I think extraction for commercial purposes, you've got to be part of the union. You can't, you can't sell you know, the way I understand it. Okay, um, other co-management models. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk just for a moment about Maine. And there's, you know, there's home team models we can look at. But Maine's a really interesting situation to, Know, Maine lobster, right? Famous uh, fishery. Uh, and this is a great book that was written on this uh, by James Atchison. He's an anthropologist from the University of Maine. He wrote this great book about the lobster gangs of Maine. Uh, in the Maine coast, uh, lobster fishermen are based or associated with a port. And so these, uh, and they've established these informal systems of regulation. So uh, it's limited entry. That limited entry is somewhat informal. Uh, you've got to know people, you've got to have family history or be invited uh, through connections. It's very hermetically sealed socially. These are very cohesive uh, communities, and it's uh, hard to break into a harbor and, and, and enter the fishery unless you have connections to that fishery. And a lot of those fishing kind of territories are handed down through familial lines. You know, that sounds very familiar to fisheries in a lot of places. But uh, here's just the territories, the ports, and the territories, and, and where they exist. Uh, and fishermen kind of have their established territories uh, in the areas, and, and there's kind of informal regulation of, of how those territories are uh, established, the boundaries between them, and how space is allocated, right? Oh, one of the things they do is they develop the VNOC system, so if somebody catches a, a female lobster uh, during breeding season and it's got, you know, it's buried, meaning, meaning it's got eggs, they notch the tail. And, uh, and that just uh, later on in the uh, non-breeding uh, season, non-reproductive season, any notched lobsters are, are, are released from traps, right? This is protecting the breeding stock. 
Uh, but the other thing I think is interesting with them is they have graduated sanctions. And that means that if you intrude on someone's territory or you take a notched lobster the first time, it's a slap on the hand. Some shaming, some things like that. The second time, it gets more serious. The third time, you're basically out. So it's a graduated system of informal penalties. And it's very strictly regulated. I mean, these are, you know, these are strictly regulated fishing communities. So I think this is really interesting. And I put this example up here because this is a little different than Chile, right? This is more informal. There's less involvement uh, with the state as a uh, as a co-management partner. You know, the state is involved in, in, by the state, I mean the feds and the state of Maine. Uh, but it's largely regulated informally. And I think that's really interesting because they've kind of sorted this out and, and it's pretty sustainable from, from all accounts. But um, when you yes. talk about <clears throat> these graded penalties there, are those enforced by enforcement officers or no, by your no. peers? And by your peers. Yeah, by your peers. Uh, by and large, it's through peer things. So. Um, and there's social norms, right? So if you violate the norm, you take a notched lobster, uh, that's a big no-no socially. And that's a really effective way to get people's behavior. Now, when you talk about enforcement, for example, for Hawaii, you know, to me, there's two forms of enforcement. There's the formal enforcement, that's no care, DLNR, right? Uh, ticket, you know, for breaking the law. And then there's informal enforcement, right? And so if you go out and you spear fish off the beach and you catch a fish that's too long or a fish that's out of season and close and you come in and you get a ticket from Doe Care, that's one way to get penalized. But if you come in and there's two big guys on that beach that are, you know, the, the, you know, the people, that's a, and then they shame you and they tell you don't do that again or don't come back here, don't let me ever see you back here, that's an informal system of regulation but equally effective, right, in a lot of ways, maybe even more effective. So, uh, you know, and that's what's going on in the mains. It's largely the latter, the informal uh, system of regulation. So, yes. So you've effectively been able to change people's perspectives and perceptions on things over what time frame? Because I mean, you went from take all to management locally yeah. by shaming the guy who did the stuff from the local people, right? So they have to change their perception. How long, how long of a time frame would that take? 30 years? Depends on where you're at. In Chile, about 12 years. 12 years. And they did those pilot projects for 12 years. And that was the thing. thing there. But we're actually getting together. I'm going to Sweden next Friday. And what we're going to do is we're going to sit down and take each of the places where we work. And we're going to see. That's one of the things we're interested in. How much time does it take? Most of the accounts that I've heard, minimum of 10, 12 years. And some of them take longer. I'm going to show a slide next. It's when you touch on that. Because I'm going to show a slide in the Chile. And it's basically a 50-year window. I mean, things really started in the late 60s, and now they're in this, you know, you know it's 2011. So. Because, you know, if we can change people's perceptions in five years, then I think our fisheries have a chance to come back. I was at, at that conference last time, um, last week, too, talking to the guys from uh, Guam and Saipan. They don't see a problem. They don't have fish. They don't have bag limits. They don't have size limits. They catch as much fish as they want because there's lots of it to pay for the gas, whatever it may be. So they don't have that problem yet, but I see them headed in the same direction. So because so then now they're gonna be faced with changing their perceptions. And to me that's the hardest thing. You can do all you like, but the perception of change. You get a la Allah. Interesting. Yeah. Well there, you know, it's and, and another thing I'm gonna highlight is is what's the impetus to change, right? We kind of went over that for these two case studies. So you know, some of it's crisis driven or problem driven, and some of it's just a you know a window with uh, of opportunity with key leaders in the right places and an advocacy community of stakeholders working together. That was you know both of those happened in Chile. Yes. Maybe you saw this in the Great Barrier Reef, but in any other cases, did they uh, step on or, or use the precautionary principle in regards to enacting policy or changing perceptions? Oh, it depends. Uh, depends on where you're at. I mean, most of these things are driven primarily at least in our review so far, by an existing issue rather than being proactive. The precautionary principle is that the absence of scientific knowledge will not be used to, you know, keep a, you know, planning or process, you know, from, it, from occurring. And the point is that uh, an allowed use should be evaluated on what we know and not allowed until we know enough about it to demonstrate that it doesn't cause harm, right? Uh, so, 
unfortunately, you know, like I said at the beginning, a lot of these things seem to be problem or crisis driven, so they're really reactive. Um, but if they if they design the governance correctly and, and things move forward, then it provides the capacity to be proactive. For example, in Chile, they've got this new co-management system. Uh, it's completely changed the trajectory of that ecosystem and those folks' livelihoods. And I think they've got a lot more capacity to be proactive to coming changes. And that's something I'm actually really keen on how they react to El Nino's. Because we've got some predictive capacity for El Nino now, right? So and we know El Nino changes the entire uh, Pacific, but it's really severe along that South uh, American coastline and what it, uh, what it changes over there. You know, those fisheries, the sardine fisheries just collapse during El Nino because the upwelling gets turned off, the, the nutrients big. So now they have that, you know, we've got the predictive power to say, hey, we, we think there's an El Nino coming next year. Do they have the capacity to prepare for it and be proactive about it and maybe change quotas or whatever in order to, you know, save the resource if they need to? We are finding these successes down to the Arctic Ocean. Well, I didn't focus too much on that, uh, the finfish fishery, the sardine and anchovy guys. I think the, the primary purpose there was just to exclude the industrial fishing fleets from uh, from that particular near shore area because those are small boats. That fleet has, the boats have to be under 18 meters, so you know, less than 60 feet basically in size. So it's just really reserving the, that coastal zone uh, for the I think <laughs> the short answer is that I think if you're an enforcement officer in Maine, you're for lobster, your job is a little easier than it might be if these systems were in place. And that's the key thing, right? Because um, no matter how many you know no care officers we have on the water, there's always going to be more resource users on the water than there are going to be enforcement officers. And if the community becomes the enforcement mechanism, then that's a more you know robust system. Right, because you don't have to rely on uh, the state to do it, and the resource users themselves become the stewards and the, the, the folks that you know have the sanctions against folks that break the law. So, but anyway, let me let me go through this, and we'll we'll talk more about these ideas because this is actually this is more fun having like a conversation like this. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll kind of skip over these, but I, the point of this slide is, is to say that there's a lot of different models out there. Um, and they all have different forms, right? But the key, again, for co-management is that the, 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 at the community level, however you define that, uh, they've been given some authority through an arrangement with the state in order to manage resources. But I want to stress here that co-management is not some universal panacea for the issues in marine resource uh, management and sustainability. In fact, there's a lot of co-management systems that have imploded and not worked for a number of reasons. Um, you know, this is all part of a kind of a larger trend to return uh, resource use rights to the local level. I mean, that's the kind of attractiveness to co-management, but that can be fraught with any number of problems, right? All politics are local. Uh, you can get people to dominate the local political scene and corrupt the process. You can get the collapse of fisheries unions, for example, in Chile. Not all of those are uniformly successful. Uh, different communities have different capacities to do their resources. I mean, you wouldn't want to roll this out everywhere all over the place because some communities just simply aren't prepared to do this. Some communities are highly prepared and are doing it in a number of ways already. So there's there's a, a range of different habitats. I mean, a range of different uh, uh, capacities across the communities. And so here, you know, for example, the California urchin fishery uh, spectacular collapse in the late '90s in the California urchin fishery. Uh, a lot of the same management measures that the Maine lobster fishery has in terms of it was very informally regulated. It wasn't really a regulated fishery at all in terms of the state involvement. It was basically an open access fishery. But they had territories, they had kind of the same kind of sanctions, you know, built in place, but they were based out of harbors, and if someone violated somebody's kind of territory, uh, they, were, they were, you know, informally regulated through these kind of harbor-based fisheries fleets. But it didn't work, and it totally collapsed. And so the question I have as a researcher is, why did this not work, but Maine does? What are the factors that are in place? That really matters. So we're starting to identify these things. 
uh, emerging co-management in Hawaii. Um, I'm sure some of these places are very familiar to you guys. Everyone's kind of watching these places. Uh, there's an existing uh, set of rules that allow communities to establish a community-based subsistence fishery area in Hawaii. Uh, there are several communities that have pursued this. Uh, two of them, uh, which of course are probably the most well-known, are Mo'omomi Bay on Molokai and Ha'ina uh, on Kauai. And, and, they're, and they're basically, these are hybridized models of integrating traditional management of marine resources into a Western governance framework. Um, and I'm not super familiar, in fact, Bob and I were talking um, on, the, uh, on the way over here about the, uh, the exact uh, legal aspects of this, so don't ask me, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, but the state does have a mechanism to establish these. And one of the questions that I, that I don't know is whether or not you have to have a standalone legislation in order to do this. I know uh, Haena has standalone legislation to, uh, to um, that establish their uh, community of subsistence fishing area. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, to me the interesting thing about this is the hybridization of traditional management institutions, which have, of course, a long history in Hawaii, uh, with these Western governance frameworks, and how you create a place-based plan within the limitations of, uh, of, of the state's uh, rulemaking authority. For example, in Haena, um, one of their main problems was, uh, was these roving bandits, right, people coming from outside the community, coming in, and, and depleting fisheries resources that the community depends on and relies on. And the way that they uh, originally pursued this was that they wanted to put into their rules uh, the ability to exclude non-community members. And apparently that was unconstitutional. You can't do that. Uh, so instead, they, they, they developed very place-based gear restrictions for that place. And it basically accomplishes the same things within the legal limitations that they have to operate under. For example, if you want to do surround fishing in Haena, you have to launch a 14-foot boat from the beach. And there's no launch ramp in Haena, right? <laughs> so this restricts people's ability to do surround in Haena, doesn't it? <laughs> so anyway, that's an example of a very specific restriction to protect those schools that they've relied on uh, you know, for ages. Uh, and that's the way that they pursued this. Um, you know, these, these community uh, management organizations are not just uh, 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 places that, to manage fish, but incredible education, uh, educational opportunities. And, and what, what we've seen, uh, in, at least in the limited work that I've done uh, in Kauai, is that uh, there's an incredible, it provides an incredible mechanism for the transfer of traditional ecological knowledge between generations, because that's a critical thing, right? How do they do it for you? What's that? Yeah, I think it's mostly informally regulated, but there is a dope care officer on the north shore of Kauai now. So, uh, you know, they have a dope care officer, a new dope care officer, who is from that area, from a fishing family in that area. Uh, so I know that's part of the package. So. So this is, um, they just released their rules. Um, very recently, so I haven't been through them in any great detail. There's probably people. Who know. So you work with Mehana, like? Well, oh, Mehana, this is Mehana stuff, right? Yeah. I actually worked next door in Honolulu uh, on a fishery uh, fishing community assessment, but uh, we got near and dear with the handle process, learned a lot about it, um, and Mehana, they you know, were dissertations on this. So I'm really interested to see uh, how this thing. And you know, this has been a long process for them, right? Years. Years, a long time, and it's been rocky, it's been tough, but uh, you know they're doing it. And so, I think a lot of people in Hawaii are watching these communities, trying to learn from them. These are kind of like the pilot projects in a lot of ways, and not the only ones. Of course, there's communities doing all kinds of fabulous things throughout Hawaii. Uh, there's great projects uh, involving like, community-based resource management. But uh, I think one of the critical things, and I, and I, I don't know how much they're doing this, um, but you know, for these for these things to be. Uh, uh, function as true pilots, we need to know what worked and what didn't. So there's got to be good baselines both on the ecological side of the thing, you know, are, are, the, are the resource, how, what's the condition of the resource, how well is it uh, uh, protected, how, you know, how's it doing compared to before it was in, in established, uh, but also socially, how is it working? Is fish feeding the community more? Right? Is there more, is there more uh, 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 involvement in the youth? Uh, in, in learning traditional fishing practices. These are kind of metrics that I'm sure the communities are very interested in. I know they're gathering a lot of that information in Haena. They're doing uh, CPUE surveys and all kinds of things. Mahana's doing all kinds of things and they're gathering that kind of data, uh, environmental and social. So, um, 
you know, I think that's an important part of a pilot project is, is, is understanding uh, what works and what doesn't. Uh, and of course, you know, as I mentioned, there's, there's, there's things going all over Hawaii. Uh, to me, the, the, I think it's uh, um, in Hawaii and anywhere in the world where there are community systems and there are multiple community systems, meaning that there's a network of communities, that that really is, is, a, is a good model uh, to adopt because networks tend to foster innovation, right? So if one community comes up with a really uh, good method for controlling invasive algae, what happens? That idea spreads, right? Everyone finds out about these things. This is a good thing. This is a this is a, a network approach in the design. When you're actually designing the governance system, a network approach is a really smart way to do it because if you know innovative ideas get spread throughout the network. And what you have are these people that we call institutional entrepreneurs. These are just people that run around that network that everyone knows that become ubiquitous leaders or idea disseminators. And, and those people are really key, right? Because they can they can transcend uh, stakeholder groups, and they also kind of pollinate good ideas throughout that network. So, uh, and, you know, in the academic world, we call these this, this network design polycentric design. That just means many centers, many nodes. You know, many nodes where things are happening, and and, and that's really uh, a place where learning happens, but where well connected uh, social actors can pollinate good ideas throughout the network. Um, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, raise your hand if you've heard of Eleanor Ostrom in this room. One person, okay. She got the Nobel Prize in Economics two years ago, and she worked on co-management and traditional management of resources. And she wrote this book 20 years ago called Governing the Commons, because fisheries resources and forestry resources are often called common pool resources, right? And she, in this book, she laid out eight design principles for successful co-management institutions. And I put these up here because this is like a, a, a road map, right? You want to develop a co-management system that works. Uh, she's been doing this work. Uh, you can tell she's not my age. She's been doing it for a long time. And in a number of situations, forestry, fisheries, all kinds of things. And they found these common design principles that seem to be associated with success. And I'm just going to go through these because uh, I think they're really uh, key if you want to look at co-management design these, these kind of systems. The first is clearly defined boundaries. What's your system? How do you bound it? Uh, and, and, some of the, and the boundary is really critical because one of the key aspects is that you can exclude outsiders from that system, right? That's a really key thing. Um, the second thing is that the rules uh, are developed by the ocean users and they're appropriate for local context, right? Some of these things you're going to read these things and you're going to go, yeah, go. Uh, collective choice arrangements allow the resource users uh, to actively participate, and I would add drive the decision-making process, right? Uh, monitoring of the resources by the resource users. For example, in Chile, those fishermen monitor those, those shellfish fisheries themselves. They know the condition of the resource. They know how much the stock can take. They, they, they use that information to set the total of wild catch. Uh, graduated sanctions, we mentioned that in the context of Maine. First time you break the rules, slap on the hand. Second time, bigger slap. Third time, really good slap, right? So graduated uh, you know, penalties for violators of the rules. Uh, conflict resolution, you've got to have mechanisms for conflict resolutions that are easy and, and easy to access, right? Uh, the self-determination of the community recognized by the high level authorities, of course, that's the state. And then finally, uh, for larger scales, organization uh, uh, as a network. You call this a multiple layers of nested enterprises. That just is a fancy way of saying a network design, right? And there's some advantages to that network in that those communities can rely on each other, can help each other out, good ideas that they that develop and disseminated throughout the network, and so on. So these are the eight design principles, you know, for which Eleanor Ostrom, part of her work, that's why she got the, the Nobel Peace Prize, or Prize of Economics. Okay, so I'm just going to review this real quick, and then I'm happy to talk about this until 2 in the morning. <laughs> but five crucial strategies that emerge from uh, from some of this work. Uh, first, the successful pilot projects. Um, in the Great Barrier Reef, these seascape experiments in Chile, uh, researchers, scientists, and fishermen working together on these first uh, established turfs, uh, showing that co-management would work. Uh, and the key thing here, to me, is building a knowledge and advocacy community of all the stakeholders, right? 
Uh, in Chile, when these folks got together, they were really at loggerheads with each other. You know, they, they view the world differently, they have different priorities. Uh, at the end of this 12-year process, they, you know, they had gotten on board, they advocated for a common solution that made it politically palatable. Uh, and, and I think that's a really key thing and a really key lesson for Hawaii, right? So managers, resource users, and scientists working together. Uh, engaging and building public support. Every marine environment has a, a complex and diverse constituency. Uh, and, the, and the public uh, at large, you know, I didn't talk about the Baltic Sea, but uh, I, I presented that at the, CMS, at the CMSP training. And, uh, and the key here was just uh, was, uh, that media attention generated the political attention that brought it to the public's eye. Uh, and the Great Barrier Reef was this reef under pressure uh, messaging campaign that they, that they built in order to, to change people's perceptions of that reef from being a pristine reef to something that needed more protection. The window of opportunity. It's during these periods of crisis that things are really open to change, right? That's no surprise. The political adage is never waste a good crisis. I think Hillary Clinton said that like a year or two ago, right? Uh, anyway, I know that because I Googled uh, this phrase to see who said it. But uh, I don't think she was the first one to say it, but I was looking for a good picture. But anyway, this is that figure that I mentioned about, about Chile. And this is the period that they've gone through, you know, from the late 60s to uh, 2008. And it's just fascinating because what happened was you had the rise of this fishery, and then it collapses in spectacular form. That's the price of the, uh, of the landings. And, uh, and what you see is that during that, uh, that crisis of the fishery collapse and the change in the government uh, from that dictatorship to the democracy opened that window of opportunity. The question, I think, for Hawaii or any community is, where's, you know, when's that window open? Can you create the window? Or and can, you, can you successfully navigate? And then they implemented these, uh, you know, these, these, these uh, pilot projects. And, then, and now they're in this phase where things seem to be working, but the question I think you ask is, are they going to be proactive? Because you know, it's not going to stay the same. Things are going to change, right? We're going to change the world. Uh, a network design. There's a lot of uh, uh, advantages to having a network of, of uh, places where there are multiple nodes that learn, but good ideas spread. You can bet just uh, in Chile, just like in Pacific Islands, if one community is doing something and it works, it gets spread throughout that network. And companies use this all the time, right? Google, Apple, Facebook, they have a culture of innovation. They'll set up uh, 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 competing groups to work on common ideas. Uh, and the point is to foster innovation and get those ideas to, uh, to percolate, right? And, and, and to develop a system that allows that innovation uh, uh, to, uh, to grow. So and in the case of marine resource management, I think that these kind of network systems you get a lot of information sharing. You get those institutional entrepreneurs, which are just basically those people that, that move throughout groups and, and that are uh, pollinators of good ideas. Uh, but there's strength in the network. There's coordination of activities. There's multiple resources that can be drawn on uh, in ways to solve problems. Uh, learning uh, is a key aspect. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, but we spent a lot of research time on learning. Where does learning happen? Uh, how does it occur? Uh, and then as a result of learning what changes are made, right? Because that's the proof that you've actually learned something that you might change your approach. Uh, I think in, a, in any kind of multi-stakeholder uh, arrangement, and this applies to basically any marine resource you can name, um, uh, one of the key things is learning about your partners, right? Uh, people have different worldviews, they have different priorities, they have different uh, paradigms. And establishing a common language and understanding your partners is a critical key step. This is often, uh, uh, you know, kind of discussed as one of these intangibles, but do not underestimate or undervalue the role of learning, particularly about uh, other stakeholders that, that aren't often at the table. Um, so, anyway, that's an ongoing process. Just to sum up, what are the traps and pitfalls? Uh, rigidity is a major trap, so avoiding rigidity and being flexible and willing to adapt. Uh, oftentimes you talk about the formal barriers, what's the legal authority, what's the statutory basis for this or that. That does provide uh, 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 obstacles that have to be surmounted. But equally important are the informal barriers, the different cultures, the different uh, paradigms, the different kind of uh, uh, worldviews that different stakeholders bring to the table. Those are equally important. And, and learning tends to dismantle these inf informal barriers. Uh, what strategies work? We just kind of went over a quick lightning summary of all these things. But building new knowledge and creating a knowledge and ad advocacy community, uh, particularly through successful pilot projects, very incredible 
and, and how powerful those can be. Uh, building a moment, momentum and impetus to change, uh, a lot of that's the engaging the public and engaging in the political process uh, at the right time, during the window of opportunity, creating and successfully navigating that window. Uh, network designs really foster innovation, learning, and adaptability. Uh, and learning is really key, I think, uh, particularly for surmounting some of these issues in terms of uh, stalemates between stakeholder groups that often occur. So some closing thoughts. Uh, integrating marine governance is just going to require us to develop a new capacity to change the way we do business. Uh, and the key thing here, I think, is flexibility and adaptability. I've talked about some strategies that I think are really key and crucial to that. Uh, we, there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, these are questions for both implementation, those are you guys, and as well as the folks who study it, me. Uh, we're still too focused on Western governance versus indigenous or traditional governance models. Uh, and there's a real need to look at these hybrid co-management models where traditional forms of management are integrated into Western governance systems. How do those work? How do we do that? Uh, that's still a, a, a major question. Uh, and, and there's still, still other big questions that, that I'll put some up here. but. Uh, we know some communities are more successful than others. Some communities have higher capacity than others. We're still not sure uh, completely what drives community capacity um, and what you know causes more community, some communities to be more self-organized uh, than others. And, and those are important factors. Uh, also, if you've got successful co-management, you've set something up, what are the uh, socio-political and economic drivers that can threaten those institutions? Right? There are things that are going to, uh, there's, also, there's always going to be uh, new threats and, and new changes that are going to challenge co-management institutions. And finally, what scales are feasible? What, I mean, how do you define a community? Uh, what's the scale of a community? That's going to differ depending on where you're at. In rural places of Hawaii, it's probably different than in very populated places of Hawaii, for, in Hawaii, for example. Uh, and how do uh, community-based programs cooperate and learn from each other? And I'll just stop there.